Good morning. Good morning. We extend a warm and sincere welcome to you, especially our guests who are with us this morning. The prayer worship with us today will be a blessing for your week. Our order of service is found on page 151 in the front of the hymnal. Please note uh, during the season of Advent, during the confession and absolution, uh, we kneel as we are able to. Also, I want to extend a big thank you to everybody that helped with the happy birthday Jesus party yesterday. I've heard word from those in attendance that everybody had an extremely wonderful time. So thank you for those who helped with that. Poinsettia orders are due on the 14th of December. So if you're still in need of an order form, they're available in the narthex and at the table here. And if uh, you have one filled out, you can give it either to myself, one of the elders, or drop it off at the church office. And again, the deadline is December 14th. The school has a number of Christmas things coming up. The band concert coming up on December 8th, which is this Thursday. Also their school Christmas program, which will be on December 18th at three o'clock. Advent uh, services continue this week, uh, 11 o'clock in the all-purpose room, and then our seven o'clock service in the sanctuary. Pause is providing the Advent dinner, and it will be lasagna and I think everything that goes with it. So uh, if you like lasagna, be there Thursday or Wednesday night. And then also Wednesday following the service, uh, we'll be packing cookies and candy for our homebound members. So if you'd like to participate in that, stick around after service on Wednesday. With those announcements, we pray the Lord's blessing upon our worship and we stand for the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We kneel as we are here. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with hymn number 357.
the stamp or the Kyrie and the color. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. to make ready the way of your only begotten Son, that by his coming may we be enabled to serve you with pure minds. For the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, the 11th chapter. Thou shalt come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with iniquity of the, for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf, and the lion, and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Romans, the 15th chapter. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness, in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles in him will the Gentiles hope. 
May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. Glory to you, Lord. And I invite you to read with me. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree bearing, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated and we continue by singing hymn number 344.
Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning is the Gospel lesson, which was read at the lectern from Matthew chapter 3. What a sight he must have been. No, I'm not talking about, you know, Santa in the night before Christmas, but John the Baptist, what a sight he must have been wearing his camel-haired garment with leather belt, probably a ruddy-looking individual living out in the wilderness, eating locust and wild honey, and that locust always gets us, doesn't it? While they may be a very good source of protein in some parts of the world, uh, and sometimes they're chocolate covered, um, I'm not so sure that that's the kind of locust that we're referencing here. I've had others say that the locust refers to the fruit from the locust sycamore tree. And this morning someone came up, you mean those long strippy things that come off my locust tree? No, not those seed pods that are, um, even a lawnmower won't digest them. But like a fruit, think of like a fig and wild honey. Maybe he ate the insect, but it's a whole lot easier to stomach him eating figs and honey. Anyways, regardless of what he ate, He's out there by the river and he's proclaiming a message. Now, have you ever paused to wonder why in the world would somebody go out from the comfort of their home to the wilderness by the river to listen to some guy dressed in camel hair and leather belt? I mean, if, if there were somebody standing down by the Fox River proclaiming a message. Do you think all of Elgin would go out to the river to listen to that person? I suppose it would depend on what the preaching is, but maybe many would just say, oh, it's another homeless person down by the river, and he'd be ignored. I'm sure there were people who say, oh, he's just another, you know, wannabe Messiah out by the river. But people were told Jerusalem, Judea, and the surrounding countryside, people were coming to listen to him. And I would suggest that God the Holy Spirit was at work in those people who heard of John preaching, even if it was purely out of curiosity. I think the Holy Spirit can work through curiosity to draw people where God wants them to be. After all, we have, you know, the disciples sitting under the tree, Nathaniel, I believe it is. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And his friend says, just come and see, just come and see. And the Holy Spirit works, draws these people out there, but the Holy Spirit is also at work in the message that John is proclaiming, a message of preparation for the coming Messiah. And people were going out, and they were listening to his message, his message of repentance, repentance. Hey, you sinners, turn from your sin and prepare yourself for the Christ. Now, there's all sorts of preparations going on in our homes, aren't there, for Christmas. Decorations are being hung. We're now well past Thanksgiving, so it's okay to play the Christmas carols and light the Christmas decorations. Not to mention there's baking, 
cookie baking, candy making, whatever else, preparations, cards being written, all those preparations were Christmas. And John the Baptist, I don't think he's a humbug and say humbug with all that, but he'd say, but are you really preparing for the Christ? Or are you simply preparing for another season of celebrating his birth? Because after all, those people coming out to the Jordan, they're not going to at some point hop on their camel or walk to Bethlehem to see the Jesus child. Because Jesus has already been born 30 years ago. And John, it isn't that he's isn't concerned about Jesus' birth, but hey, he's coming. He's coming. The kingdom of God is drawing near. The kingdom of God is still drawing near, even though it's here. And the kingdom of God that's coming to John is not a baby Jesus lying in a manger with angels and shepherds. No, the coming of the Messiah is the one who comes as the judge, as the judge. And are you ready to meet him? Have you prepared yourself? And the first preparation is repent, repent. Turn from your sin, confess it, repent. I know many of you have those garments. If I could hack into everybody's garment, I'd change that annoying message when you know where you're going and it doesn't know that you know where you're going. And it always tells you to turn and make a U-turn, make a U-turn, make a U-turn, make a U-turn. Must be legal in Illinois to make U-turns because I see lots of people do them. But I change that to repent, repent, repent. Because that's what it is. You're making a U-turn against your sin. And it's the message already from the Garden of Eden. After Adam and Eve sinned, God comes and he wants them to confess and repent. Adam, where were you? I was naked and afraid, so I hid. Now, Adam, who told you you were naked? There's only one other person in the garden. She wasn't going to say anything because she was naked and afraid too. And God said, did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat from? <laughs> yes, I ate. That's all Adam really had to say was, yes, I ate. Is that what Adam does? No. It was that woman you gave me, God. She ate and I ate. Blames the woman. Blames God. God turns to the woman. What did you do? It was that serpent. He deceived me and I ate. All she could have said was, yes, I ate. But no, they blame, they blame someone else. They blame circumstances, they blame God. And we're good at doing the same thing, aren't we? We're Adam and Eve's children, their sons and daughters. When we're confronted with our sin, it's a whole lot easier to blame someone else or some circumstance rather than to own up and confess, yes, I have sinned. I have most grievously sinned. Why? Because we're afraid. What are we afraid of? Ponder that for a moment. We'll come back to it. God goes to Cain. Sin is crouching at Cain's heart. We don't get the specifics, but there's probably jealousy involved there, envy. And God comes to Cain and he says, this sin is crouching at your heart's door. Master it or it will master you. God is warning Cain about this sin, this temptation. 
and it's going to lead to his killing his brother Abel. Does Cain listen to God? No. And in like manner, God comes to us in his word, and he warns us, hey, this sin is crouching at your door. Have mastery over it, or it will master you. Gluttony, envy, jealousy, covetousness, lust, adultery, idolatry, they're all at our door. God warns us, and no, we can't master against that temptation on our own, but he's provided us everything that we need to master it, to turn from it, to flee from it. If the church were on fire, we'd look for an exit door, wouldn't we? Do you know where the exit doors are? If you don't, look where they are when you exit. But when sin and temptation are knocking at our door, do we look for the exit? No. We feel trapped. We allow it to master us. And then instead of repenting of it, we blame. John says, no more blame game. Own up to your sin. Repent of it. Repent. Step one of preparation is repentance. Now I ask you to keep something in your mind. Do you remember it? Because I forgot what I asked you to remember that we'd circle around to. Oh, yes, Madam Secretary. Oh, what are we afraid of? Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. She's a great secretary. I'm so happy to have her in the office because she helps me remember other things too. Anyway, what are we afraid of? We're afraid of punishment, aren't we? Discipline, anger, wrath. And we have nothing to fear about. Every time God does something big in the Bible for his people, the message comes, fear not. That's kind of the refrain throughout Advent and Christmas. The angel comes to Mary. Mary's afraid, isn't she? Fear not. Angel comes to Zechariah. Zechariah's afraid. Fear not, Zechariah. Joseph is afraid. He's afraid of a lot. What are people going to think of me if I take Mary for my wife and she has this child? Because we do know math, don't we? And we do know generally there's nine months between conception and birth. What will people think of me? What will people think of her? What are we going to do? Joseph's afraid and the angel says, fear not. And of course the shepherds, they're really terrified. Fear not. You and I have nothing to fear because God has taken that fear away through his son, through his son. No fear of death, no fear of unquenchable fire if we are fully prepared. Nothing to fear. Because we live now in baptismal grace baptismal grace. John's people, they came out, they repented their sin, and they were baptized as an outward expression of their inner confession, repentance. Hey, didn't I see you down by the river the other week? Well, yes, you did, by the way. Should you really be doing that? Not quite that way. We're baptized, a different baptism than John's baptism, but our baptism includes repentance, but then also that lavish washing away continually, continually, continually of our sin. Because we're in this baptismal grace. Grace is God's undeserved love for us. It was there for Adam and Eve, for Cain, for every sinner up to you and I and beyond. 
God's undeserved law. And it's baptismal grace because it's through our baptism that we are brought into that grace. But not only brought into it, but by that very means, the benefits of that grace are extended to us. Forgiveness of sins, no need to fear. Everlasting life, no need to fear. Salvation full and free, no need to fear. In fact, we'll have a foretaste of the feast to come in a moment, whereby our faith, our trust, our hope, our strength in Jesus as our Savior. Because you see, we're not preparing for Jesus' birth as much as we're preparing for Jesus' coming. His coming for us. His coming that brings this world of sin and death and misery and sorrow to an end. We're preparing for that day, but we're also preparing for that day when the old heart stops beating, our brain stops sending out brain waves, and we've returned to that lump of clay and dust that we were when we started. Maybe some of us, by God's grace, will see the day of our Lord's return, but many of us will leave this world before his return. But we're also preparing for that, because as we see day in and day out on the news, people's lives, whether by natural cause, by death, by accident, by someone else's sinning, life can be taken away so quickly. And are we prepared to meet the Lord? John the Baptist, his message is just as good for us today as it was then. Repent, live in this baptismal grace, but then for John it was, bear fruit in keeping with this repentance. I saw you down by the river the other week being baptized by that funny fellow with the camel hair suit and the leather belt. And I know what that means, and it means you're not gonna do that anymore. Why are you doing it? Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if our confession and our faith just eliminated sin in our lives completely? We're still gonna sin, but do we repent of it or do we just ignore it and go on? Living in that baptismal grace, we know we're already forgiven. We already know God's love but he wants us to bear fruit. And again and again, Jesus reminds us that he's the vine, we're the branches, and our whole purpose being grafted into him is to bear fruit. Not fruit that little Kevin, aka Jack Horner, who sat in the corner eating his Christmas pie, you know how it goes, he stuck in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, my, what a good boy am I. It's not that, that fruit bearing is my, what good, boy and girl we are. We're living our life so much better than everybody else. No. The fruit that we're to bear is in keeping with the faith in us. God gives us the fruit to bear. He expects our lives to bear that fruit as we're grafted into his son, the true vine. And the whole purpose of the fruit is to remind people out there that we're, we're not worldly trees, we're Christ trees. We're not worldly trees, we're not gonna bear the fruit. We may sin, but we shouldn't be bearing the fruit of the world. You wanna know what the fruit of the world's trees are? Just look at your TV commercials. That's the fruit of the world's trees. Our fruit, just to name some, peace, joy, gentleness, long-suffering, you know, those fruits of the Spirit. They're in line with our faith. They're in line with our being grafted into Jesus. And that fruit he likes to see. When you go to an apple tree in the fall of the year, what do you want to find? Apples, right? 
Even if you don't know one apple from another, you will know an apple tree because it has apples on it. You may not know the kind, but you know it's an apple because of its shape. An apple is not the same shape as a pear, is it? If you want a pear, you go to a pear tree. Maybe there's a partridge in it too. If you want apricots, you go to an apricot tree. If you want love, peace, joy, kindness, you go to a Christ tree. He perfectly bears the fruit that we imperfectly bear in this world. And then if that's all in place in our lives because of God's working miraculously in us through that word and spirit and that water and that fire, then we're prepared for Christ's coming. We don't have to fear the ax that's gonna cut at the tree that has no fruit. We need not fear that we're the chaff that's gonna be swept into the unquenchable fire. We will know in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls that we are God's children. We will be repentant and contrite. We will live and walk in our baptismal grace. And by God's work in us, through that grace, we will bear fruit in keeping with our faith. And we'll find ourselves at last, not in the unquenchable fire, but in the eternal storehouse. Not a dead tree, but a life-bearing tree. So you see, John isn't so much about be prepared to celebrate Christmas, not that that isn't important, but John is really about being prepared for when Christ comes, not as the Savior, because even in John's day, he had already come as Savior. He'll announce him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but the real preparation is when he comes again as the judge eternal. And to prepare for that, we must be repentant. We must walk in our baptismal grace, live in that baptismal grace, and bear fruit in accordance with the faith we carry inside of us by God's work. And then we will be prepared. He warns us, as he does the Pharisees and the Sadducees, don't think you're safe because, like your family's been church members for forever, because that isn't going to matter. What's going to matter, are you repentant? Have you walked in the baptismal grace? Are you bearing fruit? And we may not behold that with our eyes, but God who sees all and knows all does. And so prepare yourselves. It's not just an Advent thing. It's not just something, okay, Advent, then we skip over it till Lent. No, it's a lifelong thing because we're preparing for that day when we see our Lord Jesus. We won't see him as the infant of Bethlehem. We'll see him as the risen Lord, judge eternal, nail marks in his hands and feet, a spear mark in his side. And we need not fear because it's been our Father in heaven's good pleasure to give us the kingdom in his Son. So let us rejoice, let us celebrate, let us continue to prepare for that day of the Lord, when the one who began this good work in each and every one of us will indeed bring it all to full completion when our Lord Jesus appears again. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which is beyond our understanding, keep our hearts, yours and mine, in faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. We stand and confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, 
God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not me, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of a Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the prayers of the church. Please note our response in the prayers has changed and the response is included on the front of your service folder by the prayers of the church and then it will have the responses. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church, that God would continually feed her with his word and sacraments as she looks for Christ's return. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the Church, that pastors would continually prepare the way for Jesus' return in glory by preaching law and gospel, and that congregations would hear their words in faith. Let us pray to the Lord. For families, that they would faithfully fulfill their vocations to love and forgive one another, even as they grow in the fear, love, and trust of the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. For civil authorities, that they would govern with justice and righteousness as leaders appointed by God to protect the innocent punish the wicked, and work for the common welfare of all. Let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and suffering, especially Jack Vanick, Paul Ehorn, James Epson, Dave Heinrich, John DiMichelli, Chris DiMichelli, Chad Ader, Deb McLeod, Dick Wendt, Carol Chevalier, and Carol Wilkerson, that as the day draws near when the wolf will dwell alongside the lamb and pain and destruction will be no more, God would grant them patience, comfort, and healing according to his will. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who commune this day, that their hearts would be stirred up to make ready the way of the Lord Jesus, who comes in his body and blood. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Grant, Heavenly Father, that we may be kept in joy and sustained in hope through every trouble and trial of this mortal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
Let us stand. your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and calling sinners to repentance, that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh. Bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.